Dear graduating students, dear parents, family, and friends, dear Bard College Berlin community, welcome to the commencement ceremony of the class of 2023. You are on the verge of diving into a new phase of your existence. You're full of energy and confidence and lust for life, and that's the way it should be. There will be points in your life, however, that for whatever reason, or for no apparent reason at all, you might feel as if you have lost the plot, as if you were on this clear path and totally inexplicably it has vanished. Right at a time when you thought that you had figured it all out and you finally had discovered a way to make life work. It is a hard thing to realize that you simply do not know, that you're surrounded by uncertainty and there's nobody to point to a way out. These moments of not knowing, however, are precious. They create a space for the silence within and allow the seeds of questions and doubts to come to the surface. This is where new beginnings are possible and a new direction can be taken. This is where something can take root and grow. A French designer once said, il faut protéger les moments où on ne sait pas. One should protect the moments in which one does not know. Perhaps these are also the moments that one is most open and willing to get rid of the rubble and the noise and to invite and meet again that one being that is and will always be your companion, you. In a poem by Derek Walcott, this is called Love After Love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger that was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, peel your own image from the mirror, sit, feast on your life. May I now invite Managing Director Florian Becker onto the podium. Good morning. Ooh. Dear class of 2023, dear class of 2021, dear parents, dear family members, dear members of the Board of Governors, dear faculty, dear students, dear friends of Bard College Berlin. It is my privilege and my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th commencement of Bard College Berlin. This is a happy and important day. You may feel some surprise that it's already here. Some of you may even feel a sense of whiplash, just having rushed to complete your BA thesis a couple of weeks ago and just having performed or exhibited artwork at Monopole a couple of days ago, but it's real, we're here. Perhaps you are beginning this morning to feel a sense of accomplishment for what you have done at Bard College Berlin over the past four years. Before we begin to celebrate you, and we will celebrate you, I would like to take a moment with all of you to remember our exceptionally talented first-year student, Anush Kerandish, who will never have the opportunity to feel the confusion and exhilaration of graduating from university. 
I knew she was taken by an autoimmune disease at the, uh, in January this year at only 19 years of age. So if you don't mind, please join me in a moment of silence in her memory. Thank you. Commencement, commencement, beginning. Today, some things change. One of them is that your professors no longer speak to you as teachers. I, for one, will take this privilege of addressing you today not as a professor or a scholar, but simply as one adult or citizen to others, as a member of one generation to members of another. At last year's graduation on this spot, <clears throat> on the tail end of the pandemic, I offered some thoughts on the fragility of what we sometimes call normal times or ordinary life. As many of you know from experience, normal, peaceful times cannot be taken for granted and it takes continuous work and inventiveness to keep them normal. Today, I want to think a little bit about our time and what makes it normal or ordinary for us, at least for us here in the advantaged, peaceful regions west of Afghanistan, Syria, and Ukraine. What we experience as our time is shaped primarily by living memory, our own memory and that of others whose views and sentiments we experience in direct encounter. In this sense, my time as an N40 white man from southern Germany is not your time exactly, but my time and your time and the living memories of our respective generations connect in the time horizon for which the Germans have the word Zeitgeschichte. Zeitgeschichte is experienced history, our time. In this second sense, as the late historian Tony Judd insisted, we are still in post-war times. The generation that raised me and most of your professors grew up after the Second World War and during the largest economic expansion the world has ever seen. To situate Zeitgeschichte in history now, in Geschichte, this age of unprecedented economic growth had its beginnings, as we all know, in the first and second industrial revolutions of the later 18th and 19th centuries. Before then, simplifying a little bit and going all the way into prehistoric times now, there was essentially no economic growth for 10,000 years since the agricultural, agricultural uh, revolution of the Neolithic. You see where this is going. There was an epo epoch before fossil fuels, and there is one with fossil fuels. Fossil fuels changed everything. No aspect of what we experience at, as our times, our ordinary life, would exist without them and the seemingly boundless energy they deliver. The generation of roughly my parents and your grandparents, I'm guessing, for whom material abundance was normal, if not in their own family, then in the rich countries of the West, was also the generation of the global student rebellion and the origin of the green movement. The Club of Rome was founded in 1968, and uh, their famous report on the limits to growth appeared in 1972. My generation, I think, is the first who has known about climate change, global warming, or the greenhouse effect as they taught us in elementary school. For our entire life, you are the second. I am not a natural scientist, and I speak to you with no special expertise or authority. But I am certain, if we zoom out all the way, as I tried to do just now, 
that climate change emerges clearly as the central epochal question of our time. It defines our time. It affects everything and everyone, although not, of course, fairly or equally. And yet it is too easy to push away from our minds. It's not particularly sexy to talk about, or at least to my mind, too exciting to think about. Most importantly, it lies just outside our ordinary cycles of lives, our elections and institutions. In one sense, it's been moving too slowly for just about all of our institutions, and in another sense, of course, it has long since started to move far too fast for them. Dear graduates, I'm aware that none of this is news to you. I'm aware that some of you have studied climate mitigation and energy policy in the last years with us and have more useful things to say about the topic than I do. And I'm certainly aware that my generation should not come to yours for hope. Moreover, I'm not sure that I have any particularly useful advice to give you. But these sentiments, and especially the concern not to exceed our expertise or the boundaries of our legitimate authority as your professors, may mean that we perhaps don't always say loud and clear that climate change is the epochal question of our time. My wish for you, and then I'll end, my wish for you as you are about to enter professional life and therewith the institutions of ordinary life, Please bear in mind that none of these institutions was established to help answer the central question of our time. Bear in mind that very few of these institutions, in which you might work, are shaped to do so. Bear in mind that in most of them, you can probably do quite well without ever addressing the question and you will never be asked to address the question. Please don't get caught up in that. Push your institutions, make demands openly, work with cunning, use your intelligence, use your imagination, know what and whom you must fight, and most importantly, know with whom you can work. Thank you. So, dear members of the class of 23 and 21, I do think that you are well equipped to do this, and I wish all of you and us good luck with it. Now, for the more celebratory and I hope less uh, depressing part, the main part, which we will start with music, as we should, and it's my great pleasure to announce uh, two alumni and another uh, very good musician who will play for us. That's Mais Rich, Andrew Mann, and Raul Da Costa. Please give them a moment until they can get started. Thank you.
morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Bystrom. I'm the Associate Dean of the College, and I have the great privilege of introducing this year's graduation speaker. It's with deep admiration and sincere respect that I welcome the writer and activist, Mr. Baruz Buchani, into our midst. Mr. Buchani is a particularly fitting figure to address you, graduating students, and all of those with you to celebrate your achievement today. Why? First, as an academic project, Bard College Berlin takes extremely seriously not only the craft of the written word, but also the power of storytelling to shape our identities, our ways of being in the world, and indeed the world around us. It is for this reason that we offer a concentration not merely in literature, but in literature and rhetoric, with rhetoric, among other things, marking the force of words as they move others, allow for negotiation and persuasion, enable new understandings and coalitions. And beyond your studies in literature and rhetoric, many of you in the concentration and more widely are looking to make or have already begun to make your mark in the worlds of creative writing and journalism. Further, questions of mobility, migration, and forced migration are at the heart of our intellectual community. Graduating students this year have focused their senior thesis research on topics including the Russian invasion of Ukraine, peace-building options in post-conflict Syria and Afghanistan, conditions of migrant detention centers in America and Germany, and attitudes of German voters towards asylum seekers. Among these and uh, many other students and faculty with very different academic interests are those who have experienced forced migration and brought their lived experience to transform our university and wider discourse. Many BCB alumni are actively working to create a more just migration order or, are con or on connected human rights and social justice campaigns. And I know that some of you currently graduating are planning to join them in these areas. Our speaker today has brought these fields together masterfully and with enduring impact. Baruz Bouchani is a Kurdish Iranian journalist and language activist who was forced to flee his country by his government. He then began documenting his quite definitively failed experience trying to find sanctuary in Australia where he was forced into confinement in an illegal prison camp on Manus Island. While still in prison, his testimony, interviews, and articles played a key role in conscientizing the Australian public about the violence of the camp and in leading to its closure. His terrifyingly beautiful memoir, No Friend But the Mountain, uh, which was published in 2018, brought this experience to an even wider audience and in tribute to the book's combination of formal excellence and ethical urgency. It won the Australian Victorian Prize for Literature, the Victorian Premier's Prize for Nonfiction, the Australian Book Industry Award, and the National Biography Award, only to mention a few of the more important awards that this memoir won. It's been translated into 18 languages, is available in 32 countries, and is currently in production for film. Puchani has written two additional books, including a volume of prison writing, which was published just this past year. He works as well in the genre of poetry and on multiple film and theater productions. He's the winner of the Amnesty International Australia 2017 Media Award, the Diaspora Symposium Social Justice Award, the Anna 
Politivskaya Award for Journalism, and he is an honorary member of Penn International. He's currently based in New Zealand, where, among other academic affiliations, he's a fellow of the Open Society University Network Threatened Scholar Integration Initiative. As Bard College Berlin has been an active participant and supporter of this initiative, I believe that we can consider Buchani our colleague and extend to him a warm welcome on this grounds as well as the other grounds that I've already mentioned. If I may call Mr. Buchani from the wings onto the stage, please. I hand it to Baruz and say we are extremely attentive and happy to hear your words today. Thank you, Kara. Uh, thank you very much for having me today here. Uh, actually, I've done many events recently in Europe. I am visiting Europe for promoting my works and my books. I visited uh, different countries, and tomorrow I will leave uh, Berlin to Italy. And in all of my events, in most of them, I talk about colonialism, I talk about minorities, I talk about marginalized people, and uh, my work is on context of uh, post-colonial. But today is quite special, actually it's very special to be here because I should uh, give a speech to a group of students who now are in an amazing moment. They graduated with parents, with lecturers, and uh, I found it quite special for me because when I look at my life, when I look at my journey, how I studied, how I uh, went to the universities, and then my story ended up in journalism, and then in prison camp in Manus Island. Uh, I was thinking that how I approach to this event, and what should I say in this speech. I was thinking to write something, then I said no. I think the telling my story, it can be, it can give you an image about how you here are privileged and remind you that how you are privileged and how millions of people in this world, in uh, other countries around the world, they want to be here to have this position and uh, study in this place and work with these amazing uh, lecturers in this environment. And uh, I think it's important that we remember, we remind, that where we are and why we are studying and what we are going to do in this world. That's why I thought that it's better I just give you an image about my life and my work just to remind you that this privilege is important if we be aware of it. Uh, I was born on in a village, in a very remote village in the border between Iraq and Iran. And when I was born, it was a big war between Iran and Iran, Iraq, and that happened mostly on Kurdistan in west of Iran. And uh, 
in that village, the first image of my life that I remember, which is quite uh, interesting and very scary image, uh, the image of a uh, war plane on above of our village, a small village. And uh, the image that I remember that how people escape in that village, escape to the mountains to protect themselves, children, women, and people. So those images I remember from my life. And uh, that's why I say I am a son of war. I born in the middle of that war. And that war continued for eight years. And for people who didn't experience war, think when war stopped, that means stopped. So we go back to a normal life. But actually war, when it stopped, continues in different ways. War has many twins, poverty, epidemies, collective trauma, are twins for war, after war. <clears throat> so I was in that village and we had a small uh, school. So I'm not going to say how it was difficult on that time to study, but when I became 17 years old, I had to do an exam for university. And that time in Iran was like that, like one million people, one million students across the country, they uh, did an exam to go to universities. And on that time was really difficult to reach to universities. And suddenly, I accepted, I passed that exam, and I went to Tehran, the capital city. For the first time, I, I say, I threw myself to that university in Tehran. And uh, from there still continues the poverty, because my background, the place that I come from, was still suffering because of that war. Still, economy was uh, damaged. And uh, so I had to work, and in the same time I had to study. And, and also I was like a hope for my family that if I graduate from the university, I find a job mostly what they dreamed about me, that I found a job in the government, and that be a, like a chance for the family to change their lives. Uh, but at university, I engaged with Kurdish political resistance movement, because in, back home in that part of Kurdistan, our language was at danger, our culture, our identity was, uh, our language was forbidden. And I had, I had to do something for that. I had to choose that I want to find a job in the government or I had to fight for keeping that culture and language alive. And that's why when I graduated, I became a journalist. And I wanted to do PhD, but they rejected me because of my political ideas. And I became a journalist. And that kind of journalism that I was doing was, we were aware that was dangerous, that was risky because any time we expected that the, uh, they attacked our office, they arrest us, they put us in prison. And that happened in the end. 
they arrested some of my colleagues and that's why I had to leave. And I know how it was difficult for my family because they dream that I go to university, I find a job, and that will a change. That means a change in, for them, for their lives. But that happened in the end, and I had to leave Iran. I went to Indonesia, and from there, after two months, I went to Australia. I took on a boat, I went to Australia. And uh, when I arrived in Australia, in, after like a dramatic journey, they banished me to Manus Island. So later you can Google it, <laughs> that where Manus Island is, in north of Papua New Guinea, in middle of Pacific Ocean. And suddenly, I found myself in that uh, uh, prison, in a remote prison. And uh, I faced another colonialism system. I faced another system that come from a colonialism mentality. It was very related to history of colonialism in Australia. And I thought that I should find, fight against that, to expose it. Then in that remote prison, we were like 900 men. And I smuggled the phone in by collecting my cigarettes to a local officer who was working there and I brought a phone in and I started to write against that system. I was there for six years in that prison and in, throughout those years, I published around 100 opinion pieces mostly in Guardian, mostly in the Saturday paper, and some international media, and then later a book that I wrote it through WhatsApp. I was just writing in WhatsApp. I was messaging to my friend, and he translated my work to English. So we worked together. I made a movie by my phone and the movie reached to some international uh, festivals on that time. And finally, in the end, on 2019, they closed the prison camp. And I was invited by a festival in New Zealand, and I went there. And now, when I look at the past, I see a big tragedy behind, a tragedy that happened in that island, that 14 people killed in that island, hundreds of people physically and mentally damaged, and we have a record of that tragedy through <laughs> mostly writing and filmmaking. So when I look at this, that now I work as a writer, I work as a poet, and sometimes I do filmmaking as well. When I look at the past, I look at that small village, I look at my family, I look at the journey that I had and now I am here, I see that how is important that we remember the privileged, how is important that we know that we have this position, you have this position, your parents are here to support you, they are happy, they celebrate you, we celebrate you, 
But I think it's important that sometimes we should remember where we come from, what we are going to do in this world, what we are going to change, and most importantly, about our principles as a human being, our principle that why we are studying, why we go to university, why we become skillful. That is my story, and when I look at the past, is of course, it's like a, just an image. <laughs> A gem image full of, of course, suffering, but I'm proud of it because it was a long journey. And now I'm in the university. I teach sometimes and I write. I work still in New Zealand and now in Europe. And uh, Sometimes I just remember that little boy in that village. That village that I imagine if I was in a different situation, how it could be. So that is my story. You can find my books, my work, if you are interested. But that was my approach to today, to this event. And uh, I thought it's better I approach it in this way. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that I think I forgot to congr congratulate you all, or I did, so it's okay. I say it again. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Could I ask Helena Cunningham and Yaya Albagadi to the stage for the graduating student speech? Test, test. <laughs> yeah, it works. Thank you, Medetta, for the warm welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. And I hope everyone is as excited as me for the after ceremony snacks and drinks. <laughs> I am deeply honored to be standing here as the representative of our graduating class. Congratulations to each and every one of us for, for, for reaching this milestone. It certainly was a challenging adventure. Our journey as students is one we'll remember forever. The unexpected lockdown, the lost years of social connection, navigating Zoom classes, and being stuck in quarantines. Yet, mentally and physically, we preserved. Perhaps not unscathed, but present and here today. Leaving home for college is already challenging. Add another layer and attend a college in another country, hundreds of miles away from home, is even more so. Mix in a range of diverse identities and culture in a city that is so large that once we leave Panko, we really don't want to come back until the next day. <laughs> However, together we have proven that courage knows no bounds, and that embracing diversity and stepping out of our comfort zones can lead to the most rewarding experiences and personal growth. It truly feels like yesterday, our very first orientation week, walking cluelessly around campus, getting to know each other, and never knowing the difference between P98 and P98A. <laughs> and to be honest, I still mix them up. Four years have passed since, four years that we challenged ourselves in, four years filled with laughs, adventures, 
homesickness, vitamin D pills, tears of joy, tears of sadness, proud moments, and long-lasting friendships. We will be separated soon, but we'll stay forever connected with shared memories. As we near the end of a journey and the beginning of a more uncertain future, at this pivotal point of our lives, I want to remind you and remind myself that life is utterly random. If there is one thing I know coming from Syria, is that life is indeed very unexpected. If someone seven years ago today were to tell me I would escape a kidnapping scenario and evade two arrest attempts under one of the most murderous regimes, and instead, instead be here today, standing on this very stage, giving my class commencement speech, I would have probably called them crazy. Yet, here I am, alive, well, and hopeful. If this has taught me anything, is that we can never know what's coming next. We can never read into the future, no matter how scared we are of uncertainty, no matter how much we want these questions answered. The only thing we can do is to be prepared, work to the best of our abilities, and continue finding growth within ourselves. That being said, for my class, I leave you with my favorite quote, said by Kurt Hahn. There is more in us than we know. I hope it stays with us whenever we're in doubt, whenever we're planning ahead, whenever we feel we're not enough, and whenever we're lost. Remember to embrace who you are. Your own uniqueness is your own power. For the faculty and staff, thank you for bearing with us these four years, for keeping us engaged in lengthy Zoom classes, and dealing with us shutting down the camera every five minutes due to internet problems. <laughs> Thank you for being there to support and enrich us with your knowledge. For donors, who are the reason I am here today, I thank you. I hope to be able to pass on your ever-growing generosity. Last but not least, I would like to use this opportunity to thank someone who's sharing a celebration with me for the first time since I left Syria in 2016 someone who I was not able to share my happy or sad moments with for a long time, someone who taught themselves English in the mornings before my lessons so they could teach it to me the next day. Living under a dictatorship, she taught me to understand that knowledge is the only thing that cannot be taken away from you. Someone whose eyes are probably sparking with joy and pride this very moment. Mom, I'm always and forever grateful for you. No words can express how happy I am to be sharing this moment with you today. I hope this serves as a reminder to always appreciate the support system we rely on and never take it for granted. For all the parents and relatives here, I know for a fact that our success is also your success. So cheers for always being by our side and for always sharing our celebrations. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I will, I will now leave the stage to my dear friend and classmate, Helena. Thank you, Yahya, for your speech. It's been an honor to be your classmate and friend. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm not sure that I've fully processed what's happening, but here I am addressing you, so I'm hoping that it hits soon. To the wonderful parents, family members, friends, friends, educators, and staff gathered here today, thank you for your immense and generous support. To name but a few, I'd like to thank my thesis advisors, Nina Tecklenburg and Ross Shields, for their undying generosity and encouragement. I'm happy to not only call you my professors, but true mentors. 
To the staff of Bard College Berlin, I've been lucky enough to work with many of you, specifically those in the learning commons, student life, and admissions. Thank you for not only being fantastic bosses and friends, but also for paving the way for me and my fellow students to successfully complete our studies here. To my family and friends, I would not be here if it were not for each and every one of you. Thank you and I love you. Now, if you don't mind, I'll speak directly to my classmates for a second. To the class of 2023, I'd like to ask you to think for just a second about where you were four years ago. We were scattered across different continents, speaking different languages, coming from extremely different school systems, cultures, and climates. In four more years, the same will probably be true. Yet somehow, by some miracles, here we are today, everyone in the same room celebrating the last couple of years together. I'd like to take this moment, unique as it is, to not only think about what will come, but also about what has happened to bring us here, on the ways in which we've shifted, moved, learned, and grown together to reach this point. Four years ago, I was a senior in high school in the United States, preparing to move to a liberal arts college in the middle of my home country. If you told me then what would come to pass that would lead me to where I stand today, I wouldn't believe you for a second. When I transferred to Bard Berlin in August of 2020, I had no idea what I'd find. I had never left North America, much less assumed that I'd one day be moving to Europe. But the beginning of a global pandemic was enough to plant in me a desperate need to see what existed beyond my small world and I found myself abandoning plans and moving continents during a time when most people couldn't leave their homes. The class of 2023 is unique in that we've witnessed the entirety of the pandemic during our college years. We fled our campuses, returned, wore masks, quarantined in our dorms, and survived together. We learned each other's names on Zoom, and we learned how to articulate our academic views through masks. It has been, in a word, difficult. We have not only dealt with the struggles that anyone in college deals with, questions of workload, of academic pressure, of identity, but also with an unfolding global crisis, one that, given our different backgrounds and pathways to BARD, impacted us in ways both exactly the same, but also completely different. In those moments, what could have easily resulted in feelings of isolation and a lack of support, I believe only brought us closer. I came to Berlin alone, but this school instantly provided me with a community. And at risk of sounding cheesy, I'd even go as far as saying that in my past five, three years, I found family. In some of the darkest, most uncertain times in recent global memory, we were here for each other. We had to be. We quarantined together, learned how to live in a Berlin that is entirely different to the one that has returned today. In the fall of 2020, our Renaissance Corps visited the Boda Museum the day before Berlin shut down for the next eight months. That spring, we learned about the evolution of science over Zoom. We quarantined through the origins of political economy and took our modernism classes outside in spring. We shifted, adapted, were terrified, and learned how to cope a million times over, but always together. We learned how to make our own fun and how to protect each other. We squabbled and got mad at each other, and we learned how to move on like a family does. A couple of weeks ago, the World Health Organization declared that the COVID-19 virus is no longer a global health crisis. That's crazy to me. This thing, arguably one of the biggest burdens of our collective time here, is finishing just as we're finishing. We made it through, not without a number of bumps and burns, but here we are still somewhere on the other side. I'm terrified for the next four years. I have no idea what the future will bring, and to be honest, it's scary to leave this place, to leave the family that we've created together. But leaving a place doesn't mean that you leave behind the people you were there with. In the next four years, we may scatter across different continents again. We may learn new languages, discover new identities, and learn new things, but we'll never lose our time together. We've proved, had to prove, time and time again, that our bonds can withstand distance, change, and growth. So, my fellow graduates, as we prepare today to go forth into these next few years, I simply ask that you remember something that we've all learned, 
that family, that relationships, and that memories can span continents, physical distance, and time differences. Over the course of our time here, the world has changed a lot, and so have we. We can't go back to exactly where we were and who we were four years ago, but we can look out at the next four years and choose to go forth together. Thank you so much for being here, for being my classmates, my teachers, my family. Here's to the class of 2023, and here's to our next four years. It is now my pleasure to introduce to the stage my first academic advisor and BCB's Director of Academic Services, Professor Dr. James Harker. I have the great joy to announce some of, some of the awards and accolades for the class of 2023. First, I'd like to congratulate Noara Abalu, uh, who has won a Rhodes Scholarship and will begin graduate studies at Oxford University next year. Michael Niakunde has been awarded a Schwarzman Scholarship and will pursue a master's in global affairs at, uh, in Beijing. And this year's Senior Thesis Prize Selection Committee has chosen two senior theses for special commendation and a Senior Thesis Prize winner in the humanities, the arts, and social thought degree, and one for the economics, politics, and social thought degree. So I'll, I'll announce the special commendations first, and we'll, we'll give them each a round of applause. First, the committee would like to recognize Polina Nemirovskaya for the thesis, Postcolonial Social Contract for Russia, Cases of Tatarstan and the Saka Republic. The committee would also like to recognize Imani Faber for the thesis, Happiness and Hate, Low Life Satisfaction Fails to Explain Right-Wing Support in the Face of Populist Right-Wing Issue Opinions. And now I'd like to announce the two prize winners. When I call your name, please come up to the stage. The 2023 Humanities, the Arts, and Social Thought Senior Thesis Prize goes to Vala Schriefer. The Ontology of Process in Michelangelo's Prisoners. In the words of her advisor, Jeff Lehman, Vala Schriefer's thesis is a sustained, creative, and masterful interpretation of Michelangelo's uh, four prisoner sculptures in Florence, primarily phenomeno phenomenological in its approach. Uh, in intellectual ter terms, Vala's thesis is exceptionally ambitious, challenging, and even adventurous. The creative component for large-scale drawings that respond to each of Michelangelo's four sculptures embodies the deeply engaged and transformative response to art that Valla discusses in her written thesis through a different medium. As an artistic response, these drawings add a new dimension and further depth to the thesis as a whole. Congratulations, Valla. <laughs> Thank you. 
And now I'd like to announce the 2023 Economic, Economics, Politics, and Social Thought uh, Senior Thesis Prize. And this goes to Salma Human. <laughs> Reforming the fiscal rules in the Euro area, lessons from the previous financial crisis. In the words of her advisor, Marcus Giamente, Salma, Salma's thesis combines multiple forms of research to evaluate the question of how to improve the EU fiscal rules that govern the level of debt in EU countries. The thesis goes far beyond the standard requirements for a bachelor thesis and shows the passion and diligence that Salma put into this work. In this project, Salma reviews the history of the EU as a monetary un union and identifies the weak spots of the current fiscal framework. She identified three suggested policy reform alternatives and consulted the eminent experts behind them. She independently developed a set of criteria to evaluate different fiscal policy reforms and conducted public opinion surveys in three EU countries. Congratulations. <laughs> And I would also like to congratulate Vala and Salma, who both have won a prize for civic engagement and academic excellence from DAD, the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> and now I would like to present the Dean of the College, Catherine Toll, to deliver the charge to the graduates. The solution to the problem of the meaning of life can be found in the disappearance of the problem. Isn't this the reason why those to whom this meaning has become clear after a long period of doubt have been unable to tell us what it is? Die Lösung des Problems des Lebens merkt man am Verschwinden dieses Problems. Ist nicht dies der Grund, warum Menschen, denen der Sinn des Lebens nach langem Zweifeln klar würde, warum diese dann nicht sagen konnten, worin dieser Sinn bestand? Let's try another source turning from words written over a hundred years ago to a contemporary German philosopher instead. From the first look we take at our experiences, we believe we can say who we are. The second look will make it clear that some sort of programming is behind every particular way of being. This discovery, the contemporary philosopher points out, was the basis of enlightenment, of critical thinking. But it kept falling at the first hurdle. Start with yourself, and if others really need to be enlightened, show them how by your own example. The ego is ingenious at inventing new defenses against reflection. Freedom, according to this argument, lies in becoming aware of a state of being in us that has no name, that is beneath social identity, a niemandsein, a nobodiness, says this distinguished white Western European Christian-raised man. Let's leave the philosophers to one side 
A Nobel laureate introduces the content of one of her novels with the striking phrase, whoever only learns about everything from reading should please do so now. Wer alles nur durch Lesen kennenlernt, soll das jetzt gefälligst tun. The reason I quote you these paradoxes on learning and teaching is, of course, to avoid issuing a charge to the graduates in the sense of any moral exhortation. We would far rather celebrate their achievements. These include prestigious academic honors of the highest level, but also a search for the kind of freedom and awareness hinted at and elusive in the lines just cited. The professors at Bard College Berlin have been deeply impressed by the spirit of experiment and bravery in the graduating classes, as well as by their talent and brilliance across very many different areas of endeavor. You will always have the support of your teachers for the future. Please join us in recognizing the class of 2021 and in the awarding of the diplomas for the class of 2023. Thank you. We will start with the class of 2021. So you'll come to the stage, you get a flower, and then please wait in front of the stage and a group photo will be taken. Okay, there we go. Melania Damjanovic. <laughs> Matias Andrei. <laughs> Adib Hadi. Lukari Jordan. <laughs> Simon Kasberg. <laughs> Elena Müller. Rosa Samiento. <laughs> River Tabor. <laughs> Claire Jucker. Christine van den Berg. Solve Svanje Salvesen. Francis Witherspoon. Sam Sam Rick. Good. Can you all come in front of the stage? Exactly. Great.
the class of 2023. <laughs> the long awaited moment. So you can please come onto the stage, you get your degree, your graduation present and a flower. Nawara Alabut. Yaya Al Baghdadi. Vilas Alulu. Akats Al Sat. Serena Bergman. <laughs> Cosmo Bledsoe. Claire Bradley Farrell. <laughs> Sydney Chester. <laughs> Elena Cunningham. Nick the Zan Zak. <laughs> Rin Delgado. <laughs> Imani Faber. Mick Foster. <laughs> Miksha Gashba. Gordon Hartel. <laughs> Salma Homan. <laughs> Anna Sophie Klopper. Zoe Knabel. <laughs> Finn Lee. <laughs> Kashmir Lehnherr. Ray 
Chris Mueller. Paulina Nemerovskaya. Michael Niakundi. Anna Luna Olsen. Fiona Pantoga Montoto. <laughs> India Peluche. <laughs> Sarah Piacurel. Ahmad Kai Sangakal. <laughs> Batu Savash. <laughs> Philip Schmidt. Timotius Skodowski. <laughs> Fala Schrifa. <laughs> Tara Seymour. Clarissa Annabelle Shane. <laughs> August Torrenson. <laughs> Light Wise. Lillian Wilson Dashline. <laughs> ya Woy. I would now ask Florian Becker for the closing remarks. I may already ask, um, at the end of the ceremony, we will have all the 2023 students here in front, and we will make some photos, BCB, our photographer, and then the parents and the friends and everybody can take photos. So we have a clear shot of our class. Thank you. <laughs>
ceremony in only way appropriate with a lot of piece of music by our musicians. Afterwards, you've heard about the Shakoto, and then, of course, as our graduate speakers have already emphasized, we invite all of you to campus um, for a drink and a reception and informal chats amongst yourselves. Um, I'm sure our students will be able to point you in the right direction. And uh, now it's my pleasure again to announce our musicians. Here they are. Um, and, uh, yes.